welcome to our study session. Um, this evening, we're going to be hearing about our inclusive curriculum update and Larry Rother, um, our senior executive for um, pre-kindergarten through 12th educational services will be presenting with the team today. Larry. Right. Thank you, uh, members of the governing board, Dr. Camille or Castile, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some of our successes from our recent inclusive curriculum roundtable. We're excited to be able to present those to you tonight um, and talk about our next steps. Uh, before we get into the presentation, I wanted to take a brief moment, introduce the team that worked on this. Uh, Dr. Adama Salou uh, has worked on this with us. Dr. Edgar, uh, Renee Sweden, and uh, Shalene Baxter uh, worked on it with us. And if you don't know Shalene, uh, Shalene is one of our instructional coaches here in the district. And so um, we also have some special guests here tonight. We wanted to invite some folks that actually participated in our roundtable so you could hear from them as well. We have a student from Hamilton High School, Danya Charan, who's right behind me. Uh, Dr. Gina Woodall, parent at Fulton. Did you mean Mina Jones? Excuse me. <laughs> I have big wrists. That happens all the time. Uh, Christina Lucas Sheffield, our principal at CTA Freedom, and Jason Phillips, principal at Castile. And so you're going to hear from them a little bit later on about their experience at our roundtable. So first, uh, you have a packet that explains what the roundtable, inclusive curriculum roundtable was all about. Uh, I'll give you the short and sweet version. On February 2nd, we met from 6 to 8 p.m. virtually to discuss an inclusive curriculum. Uh, and we did that round table style. Our initial thought was that we would be at around 60 participants. Uh, but virtual tends to really work for people. So I think we topped out at a little bit over 100 uh, people that participated. And so that was outstanding. Lots of voices at the table. We had students uh, there, parents, teachers, administrators, folks from our district office, um, our instructional coaches. And so we presented some uh, general information to them around our standards and curriculum uh, and the curriculum vetting process. But for the most part, we engaged in some discussion regarding an inclusive curriculum. And so uh, those folks did that in breakout sessions. And then we came back in the whole group and debriefed a little bit as well. And so you'll hear a little bit more about what we presented uh, to that group and the feedback we gained and some next steps. So that was the what of our inclusive curriculum roundtable. Now I want to talk about the why. So why did we engage in this discussion? Well, we believe that all students should feel affirmed and accepted in our classrooms. And so we, that means that we want to honor the knowledge and skills they bring to us. We want to ensure that we use materials and resources that students can connect with. And we utilize an inclusive pedagogy that's responsive to our students' needs. Secondly, we believe that all students should be able to see themselves represented in our curriculum and have the opportunity to learn from others' experiences that are different from their own. And that's really what an inclusive curriculum is all about. And so to, to put it succinctly, uh, kids who see themselves represented in the curriculum feel affirmed, they feel accepted, and also learn from viewing the world through others' perspectives. So that's truly the power of an inclusive curriculum. And in CUSD, we believe that students should have both of those experiences in our classrooms. Um, you've probably heard this phrase before, mirrors and windows. So if you think about the curriculum in that regard, we want to be able to offer our students mirrors so that they can see a positive reflection of themselves in the curriculum, and also windows so that they can view the world through someone else's perspective. And we know that within our district, we have students from all walks of life. We want to honor them through our curriculum, and we believe we can do that. Uh, I also shared um, another reason for the why and the why now for this work, and that is, is that students, uh, our community and higher education, our business community expects our students to have these skills when they come to them. I shared a story of uh, a business forum round, a business forum that we did at, at Chandler High School where we had local businesses, small and large alike, Intel, OfferPad, uh, Dignity Health was there, even Chandler Fire was a participant. And we asked them, what are the skills and attributes that students need? And the number one thing they shared is that our students, when they come to them as their employees, need to be able to appreciate and work with, with folks from all walks of life, and a diverse clientele, a diverse workforce, 
and that they need to be able to have those skills uh, to work with those clients, have compassion for their perspectives and their truths and their walks of life and be able to interact with them in a positive way. And the word they use was that our students need to come to them as good humans. And we believe an inclusive curriculum is, is part of that piece of that, that, that work. So um, the rest of our presentation, we want to share with you what we shared in the cur curriculum roundtable work that we did. Um, we want to share with you what our feedback was, uh, hear from some of the folks that were there, and then talk you through some next steps and leave enough time for some questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Edgar and Ms. Sweden. Madam President, members of the board, thank you for this opportunity. So everything that guides what we do with curriculum starts with the standards. The standards are really the North Star of where curriculum uh, goes to. And we felt like a common definition was important, so we used the definition that the State Department of Ed does, and that is uh, what a student needs to know, understand, and be able to do by the end of the of each grade and standards are adopted uh, first at the state level and then at the local level. Curriculum then are the resources that are used for teaching and learning the standards. Curricula are adopted at the local level. So uh, for example, there are some states like Texas who have a statewide curriculum. In Arizona, that's up to each individual school district. Curricula will include scope and sequence of the standards, learning objectives, as well as the targets aligned to state standards. Curriculum really are the resources used. Those can be print, those can be digital. Um, resources come in all different forms now. Dr. Edgar. So as Ms. Sweden discussed, we wanted to make sure that we, for this panel, for this particular discussion, that we allowed for some common definitions. So we had curriculum and now we have an instruction and we stated instruction is really the what. How does this occur in the classroom? Um, it's the how, how does it happen? The cognitive tasks, the questioning, how do we take those standards and really present them to students so that they can retain the knowledge? The assessment piece um, is also, and these are the same state vocabulary, um, but we wanted to make sure we put it in a language that we could all understand and say the assessment is the way that we retain or obtain feedback. So we monitor and adjust based upon what the assessment is. We go back and we reteach if we need to, or we can enrich, intervene. So all those different pieces really make up what we do in curriculum and instruction and assessment. So when we adopt new curriculum, it's governed by a governing board policy. Usually curriculum adoptions are prompted by changes in state standards. So for example, in 2018, the state adopted new science and new social studies standards. When those new standards were adopted, we looked at our current resources to see if they met those standards, if they aligned and they did not. So then we went out for an adoption. Um, adoptions can be formal through a process known as request for information or a request for quotations. Um, but everything that's used in the classroom eventually is put before the board, put on a 60-day review, and then has to be adopted and approved by the board. So another thing that we mentioned, and this is new this year, is we have on the uh, district website, we have a curriculum feedback form. So if you go to the department and you select Melinda Romero Instructional Resource Center, that bottom, that red button right there is the curriculum feedback form. And a lot of our parents in this forum were not aware that this was uh, available. And since then, I think that we have received more curriculum feedback um, than we, than we uh, had expected. But we need to make sure that we put this out there. And that was something that came out of this round table, is that we need to make sure that our parents know that this is available. And let me tell you what actually happens when you choose that curriculum feedback form. There are several questions. So one, the first question is, what area does the feedback involve? So um, that could be elementary, secondary, um, and there's all the different various pieces of CUSD are encapsulated in that question. Then there's a subject or content area, whether it's elementary or secondary. The school, so specific school, 
Um, and then there's a box for feedback or suggestions. So a lot of times previously we get phone calls or emails. It's just a nice way to formalize uh, how we receive feedback and it's very easy. And then the last question, which I think is the most valuable question is, would you like contact? So parents are able to put their name, their phone number, their email, and what happens is it's tracked either myself, if it's elementary, um, if it's secondary to Miss Standard, or sorry, Miss Sweden. Um, do you see what I do for a living? I even say, I even call people Standard their last name. Sorry. I would answer. I'm sure you would. Um, so Ms. Sweden gets secondary. I get elementary. And then Ms. Strobel in uh, special education, actually it's Dr. Strobel in special education, she gets a special education questions for feedback as well. So that, I feel, is a powerful piece that we were able to share. Um, it was created this year and with a lot of different collaboration. And we we're able to get back to parents so that they have answers. Dr. Salou. Thank you, Dr. Vizier. Madam President, the board, Dr. Castile, cabinet, my amazing team here working with this team. Um, I want to share our roadmap for equity. Last February in this space, we had our first round table looking at the equity roadmap that was designed by the district office. So now we really work hard to align all that we're doing seriously around our roadmap. So again, the desired outcome really for all our kids in CUSD is to create an inclusive learning environment, a place where all our children are affirmed in their learning, in their humanity, in all that they bring to the classrooms. That's really the essence we do in CUSD, that all our children are seen as complicated human beings who come in, who are given knowledge in a place to affirm who they are. So our governing board in 2018, came up with five equity metrics. These metrics guide what we do here in CUSD. You can see the five metrics are on access, achievement, discipline, perception. All of this really, when you look at the inclusive curriculum roadmap, falls within those guidelines. But these are our metrics that guide all that we do, all that I do, and all that we do in the district really, to meet the goals set for us in educating other people's children. So the roadmap actually has three pathways, an individual pathway. We all know that we are all cultural agents, all of us in this space. We have our worldview, how we are raised, self-awareness of self and other people. And so it's really critical for us to know who we are. If I don't know who I am, how am I going to engage um, a young boy maybe from Russia in my classroom, right? This idea of the individual pathway, me, the individual, my worldview, how I see the world. It might differ from my colleague from Oklahoma, right? But again, we're here together to serve children. That pathway, really, looking at that pathway. The next pathway for our equity roadmap is this idea of institutions. Our core values in CUSD, our policy, practices, program, procedures. Does it really affirm all kids? Looking at that, really, that institutional practices that tells the world who we are, who we are, and what we believe in about our children. And the last is instructional pathway. My call is your share, this instructional piece, the standard um, a curriculum and assessment, right? This idea of instructional pathway, programs, materials, and resources used in the classroom to educate children. We know that all kids come to us. It's CUSD, actually. We have kids from 63 countries. We are actually a global school district. We have Intel, we have ASU, we have Dignity Health. We have all these companies. So we have our materials that are from our kids. So that's the three pathways that we have for our equity roadmap. And so I just went over individual pathway around employees, having that awareness. Institutional pathway, again, our core values as a school district, our vision, our mission, to meeting those um, the task in front of us. And of course, instructional pathway, which is our materials and strategies we use to ensure we are meeting the needs of all our children in our school district. And then we have these five amazing equity questions. And these questions are really for us to stop that all that we do in CUSD, right? Whether it's a programming policy, who are the underrepresented population? What's the potential impact on this group? What are the unintended consequences for this program policy? Who are the stakeholders who are involved? You can see for the inclusive roundtable, ensure that we have parents, we have classroom teachers, 
We had uh, students who are valuable members of community. We had um, our elementary teachers, secondary teachers in this space. Who are stakeholders? Are they involved in this policy program procedure? Who, who are they? And can we name them? Being really deliberate and intentional around that. And what are the barriers? What are the barriers? Sometimes we have amazing ideas, amazing policies and programs without really that critical lens. Well, what are the barriers towards a group of kids? Maybe this kid's mom work after school. This kid's mom work 3 to 11 at night. They can do homework. But what are the barriers, right? Asking those questions. And of course, how do we mitigate the barriers above? And so that's really the five questions to see USD that it's not really a part and part of all that we do in CUSD. This is our data in CUSD. We are 51% male and 49% um, uh, female. This is our racial demographic data. And in this data, we are 49%, 50% white, and the other 50% are all kids of color in our school district, right? And in that, we have kids who are special ed, we have kids who are ELL, we have kids who are socioeconomic status, who are poor children. We have care to our LGBTQ plus IA. So we have children from all walks of life coming to us each and every day. And the parents trust us to love them, support them, and educate them. Because you know what? They are their parents. That's all the parents have, their children. So that's who we are. And then right now, I'm going to call on Dania Chandra, a young, amazing, phenomenal CUSD feature um, uh, who is now missed to share the student voice in this journey of our inclusive curriculum in CUSD. Danya? Great. Uh, hello, my name is Danya Charan, and I'm a student at Hamilton High School. Living as an Indian American student in the United States, I've often struggled between celebrating my culture and wanting to blend in with my peers. I'm continually working to, blending, to blend my two identities, strongly believing that our beauty and beyond that our strength lies in our differences in our country, our state, and even community. However, rather than celebrating these differences, we have ignored them, focusing only on the white narrative in schools. My peers and I are passionate about this issue. We were born and raised in the US, but we are not reflected in school curriculums. We feel neither affirmed nor accepted and appreciated. We discuss it in school, outside of school, and even on social media, where we run an Instagram account with four, over 450 followers. This, however, is not only an injustice to people of color. White students are not given the opportunity to learn and appreciate other racist stories, their canon. Cycling back to the concept of mirrors and windows, they are not provided windows. They are only given mirrors to reflect upon their own race and appreciate their own beauty. This limits the imparting of a global perspective to students. I do not see myself reflected in the current curriculums, and neither do my peers. My white peers deserve to have windows just as much as my peers from different ba diverse backgrounds deserve to have mirrors, to reflect upon their own cultures, their backgrounds, and their beauty. Out of the top 10 books read in high schools, eight out of 10 of them are written by white males. These, book provi these books provide a limited viewpoint from those who lived many years ago. Although these, although these books are considered classics for a reason, there is no reason why those should be the only books considered as such. There are exceptional authors and perspectives to consider from people of all racial backgrounds, which should not be overlooked. For example, To Kill a Mockingbird, one of the most commonly taught texts in public schools, is a fictional novel written by a white author and is often the book used to introduce themes of racial injustice. The book details the events surrounding a white lawyer and his defense of a falsely accused black man. While this book discusses injustice, the book does this from an all-white perspective and offers no insight into the actual thoughts of the black community of the time and position the lawyer as a white savior. In stark contrast to the white characters, the black character is one-dimensional, lacking thoughts, actions, personality, and even significant presence in the story. However, in my experience learning the book, none of this is discussed. The book is lauded for what it does well, its shortcomings ignored. Although the book is undeniably well-written, it should not be relied on as the primary book intended to educate students about race. In conclusion, in order for CUSC to serve as a district where students from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, are affirmed, accepted, and appreciated for the beauty in our differences to be recognized, my peers and I believe a more inclusive curriculum is imperative. Thank you. Thank you, Dania. And now we're gonna get reflections from Stakeholders who are present. I'm going to start with Dr. Gina Goodell, Goodell from Arizona State, a parent from 14 elementary school. 
So good. Gosh. Come to ASU, please. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Gina Woodall. I'm a parent of, of three um, in CUSD. I have a, a daughter at Hamilton, a son at Bogle, and another son at Fulton Elementary School. I have to say um, this past year has been so difficult, so I appreciate everything that, that the board has done. My kids are, are in person in school right now, and everybody's healthy, so knock on wood here. Um, I had the, the pleasure to attend the, um, the study session on inclusivity, and I don't have an amazing speech like you do. But I do have a few things to say and a couple things that I, I study myself um, at, at ASU, but really I'm speaking more as a parent. Um, the windows in me, well, first of all, what, uh, what, what Larry had said about um, you know, uh, corporations wanting good humans, right? And that really comes down to empathy, I think. And I'm trying to teach uh, my students and more, more importantly, my, my own children about empathy, right? And I think that that's really at the core of inclusivity is learning about empathy. And I learned that in that meeting. We had a student, it was not, um, Danya was another student that was so self-aware and had so many ideas about, um, about how to uh, not necessarily get rid of some, some you know, curriculum that we all use and that I teach myself, but, to, but to, to supplement it, right? To supplement it because we know that demographically, Chandler, Arizona, and the United States is, is by 2035 is going to be a minority majority country. So we need to start um, giving our students, right, uh, the knowledge and understanding of what it's like to, to live in somebody else's shoes. And I think that that really comes down to education and to curriculum choices that, that we have to make. And the windows and, and mirrors, that's so important for efficacy, right? We know how important it is to be engaged citizens, I think, today more than ever. And our students have learned this over the, my own half, over the past year, um, that it's really, really critical um, in order for them to feel like they have a voice, right? We need to teach them about uh, the differences and, and, and the diversity, and not only in, in race and, and nationality and gender, but also in um, when it comes to uh, you know, people that have physical challenges, right? They have a history that should be taught. People that have intellectual challenges, they have a history that should be taught. So although I think Chandler has done a very good job, right, of of giving um, my students some pretty good curriculum, I, I should say. They've, they've, gotten, they've gotten good education so far. I think we could do better, and I think we're at a crossroads right now where we have to do better because our demographics are changing, our community is changing, um, and we want our, our, our children to be prepared, right, and to be ready for college. And so that when they come into my classroom at ASU, they know who Freedom Riders are. I've had many children that they, 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 they didn't know about the Freedom Riders. That blew my mind, right? And so I think teaching history and teaching um, our kids in, in literature and history, politics, all these things are very important. And it's important to really just diversify the curricula not only in terms of, 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 like I said, race and nationality, but in other ways too. And I, uh, a person that was in my um, that was in my group was a mother who had um, ch a child with um, different learning. Uh, di she called them learning disabilities. He happened to be gifted, like twice exceptional, and and she she had heartbreaking stories because there, you know, he was stuck um, and he wasn't really given. Um, uh, the resources that he needed in order to, uh, to, to, to move forward. And so I, haven't, I, had, I didn't really think about that as having gifted kids too and having kids that are on different um, parts of the spectrum and how to include them and make sure that they feel welcomed um, as well and, and, and so that they have agency, so that they could become these citizens that, that we need them to become, right, in order to, to have a better community and a better state and a better country. So thank you very much for hearing me. I really appreciated being a part of that group. So thanks a lot. Ms. Luca, Ms. Christina Lucas Sheffield, then Mr. Phillips, and then Daniel will close. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Salu. Madam President, the board, thank you for the opportunity. On Tuesday, I received a phone call from a parent asking me to check in with her two mixed race students who attend school at CTA Freedom. She shared with me that they had been having a hard time during Black History Month being the only student of color in their classroom. And she also shared with me that they just experienced a racist, a racist event outside of their home in Queen Creek. My conversation with the Smith family led me to reflect on our equity roundtable event and the true need for urgency around ensuring all students have a strong sense of belonging in schools and in our communities. It was an honor and privilege to participate in a roundtable event. I thank Dr. Castile, Dr. Salu, Dr. Edgar, Mr. Rother, Mr. Sweden, as well as Mrs. Baxter for organizing this event and prioritizing these matters. In terms of my takeaways, I would like to share three distinct messages with the board that I heard from the stakeholders in my group. The first takeaway I have were from our students. As you can see through Danya's narrative, they're fired up and ready to go. And they actually have the blueprint prepared for us to <laughs> just follow, right? They have so much joy, so much perspective. They are ready for an equitable representation of cultures and perspectives to be created in their curriculum. And most importantly, they're taking charge. They're forging a way for this to happen. Our students are powerhouses and change makers. And it just makes me so proud that we can learn so much for them. So thank you, Danya. Thank you. The second takeaway was from our teachers. They are ready to spread their wings and fly. Many of them are already being innovative in the classroom and creating inclusive spaces, but they do desire a more equitable representation of cultures and perspectives in their curriculum. And then most importantly, what I heard, and Shailene can, can attest to this, is they want support from the administration and board in terms of they know that they have to start forging some courageous conversations and they wanna make sure that they feel supported in doing so. And then finally, I heard from our parents in our group. They want us to prioritize creating spaces where children can see themselves, as well as have opportunities to experience diverse perspectives in our curriculum. They understand that all students gain immensely when we put intentionality and deliberate practice around creating inclusive communities. The purpose of the event, like Dr. Salu shared, was to bring together diverse educational stakeholders in a conversation around building a learning environment that affirms all students in CUSD. I do believe we accomplished that and look forward to the tough yet extremely important work that's ahead of us. Thank you. Madam President, members of the governing board and Dr. Castile, thank you for the opportunity to address the invaluable work that is taking place in CUSD. Uh, Mr. Fletcher and future Dr. Rother, I appreciate your taste in facial cover coverings this evening. <laughs> um, mirrors and windows were a common theme throughout the evening. Students needing to learn from different from uh, from others that looked they come from different backgrounds while still being able to see role models in the classroom that come from similar backgrounds. They need to see themselves in the curriculum that we exposed to them in the classroom. The experience was impactful. We had a wide range of viewpoints and voices discussing together that have been divided and fragmented for so long that the conversation to come together provided by Dr. Salu was powerful. The evening gave all of us a window into the experiences that others face when it comes to education. It reaffirmed my belief that we need to hear from all stakeholders that made, that's what made the night truly special was the voice of our students. They were powerful, they were committed, and they made me proud for the district's commitment to listen to those that we serve. The students shared with the group the need to explore the entire rich tapestry that is the American experience in our history classes, no matter how messy that history may be, and in our literature that we share with them in our community. It was truly a powerful night, um, and thank you for providing that opportunity. Danya is supposed to give reflection, but I guess she forgot. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so uh, the reflection. So um, I really enjoyed being a part of that um, place, and it was really cool to be seen. And I felt really honored and proud to be there and represent um, my peers. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for listening to what I had to say and telling me it was good. <laughs> um, uh, and um, yeah, it was just really cool, and I, I was really um, proud and honored to be there. And it was really, sorry, um, I really liked be, felt feeling like the district was hearing and wanted to cooperate with what the students were saying. Because oftentimes, I think we students think of the district and the governing board as this like entity that doesn't really listen to us. But um, it was really interesting to see how you were all just people, too, that wanted to hear what we had to say and hear us out and listen to us and work with us to improve what we felt could be improved. Um, so thank you. Well, thank you for sharing your experiences that evening. Um, we want to end with uh, sharing a little bit about some next steps, some feedback that we received, um, what we gleaned from that evening, and, and again, some next steps. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Baxter. Good evening. Members of the Governing Board and Dr. Castile, <clears throat> I'm Shalene Baxter, and I am one of the academic coaches, and I just want to let you know how proud I am to have been a part of this team. Um, we did survey our participants at the end of this, um, at the end of the night, and I would like to share some feedback with you. We had um, positive comments with how Chandler is leading with diversity in the curriculum. We had um, parents who stated they enjoyed hearing so many different perspectives and how impressed they are with CUSD. One student mentioned how happy she was with having the opportunity to engage in the conversations and um, learn the different perspectives into what teachers consider and how they teach. Um, she actually said, it made my heart happy. There were some suggestions um, that affirmed what we had already thought. And some of the suggestions were making sure teachers know the resources that are already available to them, educating teachers about multicultural awareness and culturally responsive teaching. So now we're gonna have Dr. Edgar and Ms. Sweeney, Sweden, sorry, <laughs> we'll share with you the next steps. <laughs> Ms. Standard, Ms. it's Ms. Sweden, but that's okay. Uh, so as far as next steps, we just want to share with you from the elementary perspective. Um, earlier this year, we were able to give a um, presentation about our integrated units. And I really want to just share with you, it's a collaborative effort. But for the next steps, you know, we were able to really control the integrated units by taking the new science and the social science standards and creating those um, fantastic um, curriculum maps for our teachers in those units because we were able to pull from several different resources to provide mirrors and windows, uh, allow teachers to review it. Actually, teachers really created it, so there was a lot of fantastic buy-in. They reviewed it. Um, we're going to continue that um, process next year. We'll hopefully we get to meet together uh, in a safe manner to continue that work. But we also, in doing this and working with um, my, my peers, and I met Danya this summer, and she shared with me the diver diversify your narrative, or our narrative. Um, and really, it, it struck a chord. So we started looking back at the integrated units and looking at things like the artwork that we used for social science. Whose perspective was that artwork you know, painted with? And we also had to look at our own team and say, look at our team and whose perspective, who do we have at the table? Who do we need to bring in? So prevent, uh, providing those mirrors and windows, not just uh, as uh, Dr. Woodall, I believe that's your name. Um, fantastic, thank you for coming up and sharing, but also we're looking at how do we get our teachers that maybe haven't been involved recently, involved, so we can have a diverse range, not just ethnic background, but also uh, family structures, looking at uh, abilities and disabilities. Uh, there's so many different pieces that we need to look at, and we really have some fantastic control over those integrated units, and um, something that we wanna really 
look at a CUSD and making sure that we look at this from an equitable standpoint. Additionally, we have a professional development that is being created. Um, Dr. Salou, myself, and, and there's several instructional coaches on this team. We're looking at equitable classroom strategies. How do we help teachers understand how to do this? When we talk about instruction, that slide about instruction, the how, how do you do it? We can put fantastic resources in front of our teachers, but if we aren't able to recognize our own unconscious bias or look at the multiple perspectives and not just our own, we really do a disservice to our teachers. And our teachers are absolutely fantastic. They want to learn. Thank you, um, Ms. Lucas Sheffield, for bringing that up. Our teachers are ready, our students are ready, and we're ready too. <clears throat> From the secondary perspective, we really need to make sure that our teachers are aware of what they have and then uh, give them vehicles and avenues to move forward with filling in gaps. So for example, in 2017, we adopted a new ELA textbook, 712, called My Perspectives. And one of the reasons it was adopted was because it provided multiple perspectives and viewpoints in short stories and in um, poetry, smaller selections. Um, we understand though that teachers may not be aware of what's all in there and also that many of the strategies, <clears throat> excuse me, included in the, with the readings are culturally responsive strategies. And so it was our hope this spring to uh, do some professional development to help teachers see what they had. So we're looking forward to doing that um, in the 2021-2022 school year. Finally, when we go out for an adoption, when we put out a request for information and in RFI, we do now have language in there, criteria in there, where we're looking for materials that are inclusive. And we specify what that should be. So making the next steps come to life. Mr. Rother. Well, that, that concludes our formal uh, presentation. Uh, before we turn over for questions, I just want to share with you that the evening that we held on February 2nd is the start of the dialogue. Um, we know we have a, an excellent curriculum in CUSD, but it's certainly something that we can continue to improve on. Um, uh, I can't express enough how enjoyable and how um, just energized I was to work with the team and also to be a part of the, the curriculum roundtable. I can tell you that, um, and I, I think I'm gonna summarize for parents and students and, and administrators and teachers that were there, after the evening was over, we spent two hours in conversation and after the evening was over, we were all calling or texting somebody to continue that conversation to share our excitement around this work. So it was truly uh, an outstanding evening and uh, we will continue this work. So with that, I'll turn it over for questions. Thank you, Mr. Rother, and thank you for your whole team and the parents and students and staff members who came this evening to um, to share their their perspective um, of that evening also and and what they got up, what each one of you got out of it. Um, it's it's wonderful to hear that, and and I truly appreciate you taking that the time out of your your very busy schedules, not only to attend the curriculum roundtable, but then to come and come back here and share the share your perspectives with it. Um, I guess at this point in time, I'll open it up to the the board for comments and questions. Um, Miss Love. Thank you um, for the presentation. I loved it. Um, I feel like I was Danya um, at Hamilton High, <laughs> reading To Kill a Mockingbird and wondering why The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison was on the optional reading list um, when that book does such a phenomenal job at covering the dynamics of race. So thank you for bringing that up because I don't think when I was your age, I had the tools or words to really voice that. Um, my question, I think I have a few, but we talk about unconscious bias a lot um, to the point where we've been having these conversations for years and years about like, the unconscious bias with our, within our teachers, our administration. What does the PD look like to address that and what are the measurable objectives that we're aiming for to determine success in that area? So that Danya goes back to the classroom and 
we're presenting her material that is inclusive, but we're also making sure that the educator in the classroom is also presenting some curriculum that, I don't know what my word is, but sometimes we get it wrong when we're talking about curriculum, right? Or we're talking about like an issue of race or inclusivity. Like we have the material in front of us, but we may say the wrong thing, right? Um, and offend. What are our objectives? Thank you, Ms. Love, for mm -hmm. that question. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, uh, we are actually, Ms. Sweden and I, we've talked about this for, for the last three years. How do we build the capacity of our faculty here in CUSD to teach multicultural texts, to teach about black hair, to teach about the N-word, to teach about the complexity of language in our lexicon in schools? So that's ongoing. But right now, we're working in a four-hour um, uh, cultural responsive um, uh, teaching model that starting July 1st, all CUSD staff will participate in that module. Um, Dr. Edgar share with you all, we are working in the six hour also equitable classroom practices. We're gonna be embedding videos. We have Daniels and half team actually a part of students who are recording their voices. We send them 10 questions, the students across the district, um, sending them um, from Castile High School to DCP Airy. We're gonna be creating this six hour class and four hour classes with student voice and teacher voices actually also to do our training in CUSD. We know it's ongoing, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, this past fall, we had a training around implicit bias for all, all our schools, all our equity teams, our admin came together, and some schools went back and did training with their staff. We know it's not easy, it does can be done overnight, but we're on track. Ms. Sweden and I have actually talked about creating a course around teaching multicultural tech, what that may look like. So know that we have done our radar, we're developing training modules, we're developing the learning opportunities for our staff in CUSD to gain those skills to be able to engage um, um, those texts and the complexity of those texts that they have to teach our students. Mm -hmm. And then there was a comment about like teachers want more support from the board in doing this work. Um, and I'm just wondering, I don't know if you're the right person to answer this question, Dr. Salu, but what is the support that our, our teachers feel like they need around doing this work? I mean, when it comes to support though, I mean, mm -hmm. for example, right now we're planning our summer equity symposium. Mm -hmm. I know for the first one, the board, Dr. Castillo, the district, resources was provided for us to do that. Mm -hmm. It was a two-day symposium with 500 staff, right? Coming mm -hmm. together, learning together. We brought in thought leaders across the country to engage our faculty, right? We would like more folks to come, but we have 500. That was a nice start. So the board and Dr. Castillo and the cabinet really support the office, providing us the resources we need to bring in speakers, to bring trainings in the district, to really build capacity. I know you start doing this work, there are those who come, they are like, yay, they're champions, mm -hmm. and there are those who have to pull along the way, right? Mm -hmm. But in terms of the board's support, I, in my position, and I think my colleagues, I feel the support, I get the support, um, when I engage the cabinet, the superintendency office, and all of that, mm -hmm. in regards to what we need to do the work well in CUSD. So I'm not quite sure, but from my own lens, in terms of what we do every day, mm -hmm. the support is very clear and evident in, you know, through what I do. No, the only thing I would add, I would add, is one of the themes that we um, that we heard that evening, and um, Shalene mentioned it was the need for those resources and to take a look at what's available for our teachers from a, from a resource standard. That do they have what they need in terms of curricular resources to be able to provide those mirrors and windows? So that's mm -hmm. definitely something that we're looking at and uh, evaluating the curriculum that we do have and the resources that support that curriculum. But is it more than just a resource well, issue think, or like support from the board or like how do you feel that we could be good stewards of equity aside from that? Like do we need to be, you know, at the symposium, you know, like. Well, yeah, when the symposium, <laughs> several board members were there, the smallest them was there for a few days. Mm -hmm. Dr. Castillo was there every single day and so was other board members who were here. Mm -hmm. I think there's this perception of our, some of our teachers who live in fear. They are afraid that if they teach the blue SI, for example, they'll get into trouble, right? And that's the fear they have. And we've assured them that, well, there are things teachers say as a teacher, and there are things we don't say as a teacher, right? And so really balancing what teachers say and what um, students say. 
So there are teachers who say, oh, I'm afraid I can't teach that. And they've said that to me, hey, we love the work you're doing, but I'm afraid. There's this mm -hmm. sense of fear, right, that people have, that if I teach some, con you know, con some content, I'll get into trouble. So what we say, Ms. Sweden and I, Ms. Emma, <laughs> Dr. Edgar, well, just, just teach. If you teach what you're supposed to teach, there's no fear to get into trouble, right? This idea that you have my back. Do you all have my back, right? And, and I, do, I do hear that also, do you have mm -hmm. my back? And again, the, what we say to them, like, of course we have your back, but again, there's strict guidelines. I can't talk about politics now, whether it's Republican, Democrat, we don't do that. But we can teach ways to still impact the classroom and the kids we have in the classroom. I have more questions, but I'm gonna turn it over because we only have a few more minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Does it, do any other of our board members have any comments or questions? If I could just jump in for a second. So sure. I swear uh, Lindsay like could read my handwriting from 20 feet away because <laughs> um, I had very similar questions. Um, but I, I guess, you know, I too was thinking about, you know, this is beyond curricula. It's beyond textbooks. It's like um, a, the culture of CUSD, right? And I think um, I just wanted to thank everybody over the last couple of years who have done so much putting resources towards this and having an open, openness to moving beyond what your previous experiences were and looking beyond that. And um, I wanted to thank um, Dr. Salou um, for all the wonderful equity seminars. We just had another one this week. And CEA, who's been having um, the you know uh, book sessions, the book clubs on different topics related to equity and other issues. Um, and you know, for, for all the things that we are providing for teachers to be able to do this. But my one question that overlaps with what was already mentioned is, um, what other kinds of support are they looking for from us? Um, have we, and have we looked at some other things? For example, um, the research that was done on like the AP computer science videos that were made a few years ago that had more students of color and women in it and how it showed that it greatly increased the number of um, students of color in that program when they, they did those kind of things. Are we looking at maybe how can we reach out to those students, maybe students with disabilities, students of color, um, female students or male students who are not typically represented in certain programs? How do we reach those kids? Do we have anything going on with that? Yeah, so uh, Ms. Bruner, thank you, good, good question. And there, that's a big question. Um, and so what I can say to you is that um, our team is gonna continue to work with teachers about what they need, what resources that um, they're, they're asking for, and what can we do to ensure that our programs, and you mentioned the AP Computer Science, are reflective of our demographics, are reflective of our schools. And those are conversations that our sites are engaging in. Uh, we have a student success indicators that all of our sites look at in terms of how our students doing. And so that, con that conversation will continue. Uh, we're just starting that. And, and when it comes to the curriculum aspect, we're gonna continue to engage our teachers and what do you need? How can we support you? What data can we look at to ensure that we're um, implementing an inclusive curriculum? Um, the purpose of the, the meeting on the second was truly to ensure that we started the conversation and, and with the goal of providing an affirming classroom for every student, whether that's AP computer science or first grade or mm -hmm. whatever class that is, every student should feel affirmed and accepted in their classroom. So we're gonna to continue to find ways that, that, that we can do that. Um, as a side note, if you'll notice some of the pictures, this is obviously pre-COVID mm -hmm. uh, pictures. This was one of the things that we did not let fall by the wayside, regardless of the pandemic this year. A lot of things had to be put on the back burner, but we ensured that this wasn't put on the back burner and that we engage in this conversation because we know that it's uh, important for uh, our district to move forward in this area. And thank you, and I just wanted to ask um, Dr. Sulu too, if you had any input about resources or ideas that you think we could go in the future that we're not looking at right now. Um, clearly, the, thank you for that question. Another great question. There's a lot of research coming out around best practices mm -hmm. in regards to how do we do this work well. I can say that CUA is on the right trajectory. Because looking at the curriculum, we know that as look at those five equity board metrics, 
it's really about the curriculum, good instruction, teachers who have the capacity that we're going to support and build them up, right? You came Monday night um, to the lecture Monday night. We had almost 100 people come Monday night for that lecture. Mm -hmm. It was well done. Um, uh, talking about uh, Asian students, because, again, often Asian students are minor, you know, more than minority, but that lecture was so profound that teachers, my email was going off all night <laughs> the next day, right? Mm -hmm. Folks are asking for Dr. Nakagawa to walk, come back again for a second time. There's a lot of research happening out there that we're going to be embedding, right? But we know that the curriculum is really central in teaching and learning and creating the affirming learning space um, um, in our classrooms. Right now, Arizona Education Foundation got some money from Boeing. They've created some amazing, amazing modules. We also here in CUSD, we are creating our own amazing modules. They're going to be rolling out, deliberately rolling out to all our schools. Sometimes it's hard that you have those captured audience of teachers who come to everything, and there are those we need to get out to that, uh, <laughs> right? And we all know that's a challenge, right? How do you get to those teachers? Oh, I'm good. No, 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 I'm good. And we, we've done this before, engaging those teachers also. They're, they're good. And they come like, oh my God, I learned. So we're going to keep reviewing that and work with my colleagues in curriculum and instruction, working with Ms. Drug Abbey in, um, um, in PD, um, working across the district with our principals to really support and build capacity from all angles, whether it's our lecture series we do every Monday night, whether it's our summer symposium, whether it's our fall trainings for equity teams, and whether it's articles we're reading. We're going to keep looking, examining, and just looking at best practice in the country um, uh, and bringing those into our school district. It's ongoing, Mrs. Boyner. Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, thank, we appreciate everyone being here. We know this work takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. And um, it is a change of, of culture within the organization to make sure that um, we can, we can um, continue, this, continue this work. Um, just one question, real big question. Is there going to be another round table? <laughs> Well, our plan is to, this, this is a great model to use to get folks around, regardless of what the topic is. Uh, our plan is to continue to um, elicit feedback. Um, are there additional roundtables in our future? I think I can confidently say yes. Um, we'll certainly be continuing to reach out in that fashion. I have to tell you that uh, the virtual roundtable it's a lot easier for people to, to seem like they come out. So we were expecting 60, we had 100. Uh, you know, virtually we could do as many as we need to. So, yes. And that's fantastic. Um, you know, it's a great, uh, great way to use our digital resources. <laughs> so thank you so much. And um, um, we're going to, we do need to move on to our regular meeting. Uh, we'll have a couple minute break we'll, so that uh, you folks can um, Leave if you want, um, and we can allow uh, additional people to come on into the room. Thank you again.